Hello everyone, welcome to the Game Design Perspective. I'm Santi, I'm a senior game designer in the video game industry. But when I started, I was a game designer in Metro Exodus. It's a game that has a big place in my heart. I, I love that game, I love working on it. I would love to talk about it because I think there's a lot of information that is not out there about the development of this game. And I think that it would be very interesting to talk about why some decisions were made, the process of making video games, especially these type of games. A lot of people consider Metro Exodus double A game, a double A game. Some other people consider it like triple a game me personally i think is uh it has a triple a heart <laughs> you guys know what i think about triple a but i think it has a triple a heart with a double a budget <laughs> people we all worked really hard on this game you guys have no idea so i made a video for you guys about my favorite level called volga i would like to go through it with you guys and talk about the the experience the philosophies stories little secrets uh and things that i i know about that game during my professional tenure at like 40 games i think i finished this level 75 times in the span of three years and I'm, I think I'm cutting it short to be honest so let's check it out no so I have it for you guys here so funny thing um, originally this section was just Anna standing there from the beginning and then one of my first tasks was to storyboard all the movement that you see Anna do here I did a lot of storyboarding for Metro especially for cinematics because and I jo I'm not joking <laughs> because I had a notebook next to my desk while I was working on a prototype and the lead game designer saw that I could draw because I have an animation background. So they said, like, hey, we need help with cinematics. I wonder if like you could help us with it. And I was like, yeah, sure. So I would record in Photoshop some gameplay, moving the camera myself. And this is how I learned to use the camera tools of the engine. So I would use the camera tools to make the kind of script the motion of the camera how it would be and then i would draw on top of it where the character would be the motion the movement and stuff like that in the storyboarding the next section also has that where the characters are and everything i would kind of like predict or have like an ideal situation in which the camera would move because we don't want to take controller from the player at all as little as possible we would encapsulate the player there but in the animatic, it would be Artyom standing in place and moving the camera where I would tell like the character to do. My style back in the day, and I think still is a little bit, is very anime-like because I learned to draw by watching anime and manga, but especially Dragon Ball. It was really funny because a lot of people la like made a joke that like Metro was becoming like a Japanese RPG. When you would boot the, the Metro engine, the loading screen would show the characters with anime eyes, just kind of like a joke to my animatics. It was hilarious. It was hilarious. When I saw that, I was like, wow, you got me. Yeah, yeah, I made all these characters into anime and manga. One of the biggest philosophies of uh, Metro is similar to you know, Half-Life, in which the story happens around you, not necessarily because of you all the time. Which means that we have a scene here in which like, the captain is talking to Anna, the artist's wife, and, uh, and they are like explaining situation, but the player is, always has the choice to just go away and the story keeps happening. There's going to be a situation later that shows that there's events happening around you, you know, scripted or non-scripted, but a lot of them scripted, that the story is happening around you, not necessarily because of you. This is just an area that we wanted to show, to showcase the flashlight, and that's it. Uh, to be honest, all those uh, bodies you find in Metro that you can loot, it's actually just one body. It's one object that was scripted to have multiple variants that you could select from a list. So you could make any any character or any model like a body. Uh, it was really useful. It was super creepy sometimes, right? You would find like characters dead and it's like, oh, that's the wrong one. And they would be flagged as a bug, right? All these environments, all the rabbits and stuff like that, you see, it's very bespoke. It's not systemic at all. This is a very very handcrafted game you have no idea to the point that there was like a strike team that was designers and qa working together i'm i managed a lot of that team i helped organize it they would go around levels just playing and finding weird little things right so even the grass that you see is bespoke is is, is place it's not the best system to do it but it gives a lot of metro's character so hey this blade of grass is floating and it's like oh okay let's fix that which is also one of the reasons why i think that there is some 
floating things everywhere. It was hard sometimes. There is a system in the engine that you can take a screenshot in the engine and then you can drag and drop it somewhere else. The screenshot itself with the name and the engine would take you exactly where the bug was. So that was very, very, very nice to have. That was a really great system to have. And originally, a lot of these houses weren't there. Anna, Anna's scripting is quite complex because if you're next to her, the story will progress fully. But actually, she's very aware if you go somewhere else or you decide to go to another objective or something like that. The physics of the boat are quite difficult. I'm not gonna lie. But I always appreciated that crow and I always appreciated that you could see oil in the water. You can notice there is oil in the water. It's a fascinating touch. Uh, the art director, we call him Karma. Fantastic, fantastic. He had such an eye for those kind of details. I learned a lot from him, especially for set dressing. This is an area that, uh, if I remember correctly, I set dress with a friend, with Pablo. So whenever you're set dressing something, you have to think of the story behind. And this is like a family that died, like just kind of not being able to find food anymore. It's like really sad world. They were fishing and the fish and the fish were not fully eatable or they just weren't able to find fish. They starve and it's like really sad stories that you find all around this world. But I think that sadness gives Metro its character. This is a secret area that a lot of people I've heard do not know. You can just jump into this house and find more loot. That tricycle is one of the first physics objects we made. It moves. <laughs> <laughs> before nothing was movable and this is where like we go to Celantius and people that are scared of like uh, electricity but this area is actually very important to the game because a lot of the cell systems were play test were play tested here if you see one of the development diaries of Metro Exos you will find me arguing with uh, another designer called Pablo about the play styles of Metro and I tend to be very stealth based right so these I know by heart and you'll see I navigate it I still remember it I haven't played this game in a long time like probably five years but uh, I still remember it pretty well this is another area that I uh, I storyboarded and the motions that I'm doing now uh, are what I remember being the animatic that I uh, storyboarded so like the girl sitting on the on the bed and then they go here to look in the window and stuff like that and i'm following the camera that i prescripted so you guys get an idea of what i did so imagine there's no character here and there's no set dressing and i just draw on top of it and every 10 seconds on every 20 seconds i do something else you know and then i move them again and i move them again a certain amount of time right and that that is sent to the motion capture team which is like a small team that like in, in ukraine and then they do the animations and then we try to set dress it and everything according to like the animatics. I'm waiting here. And the reason I'm waiting is because we did something with the AI in this specific moment that the AI is going to open the door now. And when they open the door, we make them blind for a second. I don't know if you know the secret or something, but this is like, oh, they're blind for a little bit. And that allows you to take them down with a punch, but it will initiate combat. So let's go back and then reload. Okay, so this is the cinematic again. I'm going to go forward. This is the intended kind of path. They open the window here, they open the window, and then you're able to go down. And this is the stealth approach. And the reason why the stealth approach is so important for Metro, during the whole sequence, the church we call it, we are telling the player, hey, these people are just protecting their land. We are the invaders. We are coming in. Let's not do something we'll regret or let's not kill anybody. Metro has a karma system, you guys know, that control the end. If you are a shooter player and you want to go in and shoot and everything, you can, but you will receive bad karma. I still remember my path. But in this case, if you do stealth, you get good karma. Before, with the balance of the game, it was impossible to get the good ending of the level if you were a shooter player. You were forced to be a stealth player to have the good ending. This is a secret a secret character you can find. It's really funny. Parenthesis, there you go. I finished this area. The player, if he was playing as a shooter, would not be able to get the good ending. There was not enough karma points to counteract the bad karma that you get from killing in certain areas. Me and, and the director, we went outside. I, I, I talked to their say, this is a problem the game is having. 
So I went outside and with little rocks, I plan like, like in a garden, we put everything together of the whole map. And I said, listen, we need to give the shooter players side quests. This side quest is what was going to give the player the chance, the shooter players, the chance to get the good endings. So a lot of the side quests that you see in the game is so that the shooter players have an opportunity to catch up to stealth players so they can get the good ending of every level. As you can see, this is a cinematic. So we took control of the player, but why? Because it was logical that the player, was, like that Artyom, the character was not fully in control at that moment. This is another thing that like the philosophy of Metro is that characters will talk to you, but you're never forced to listen. This is not like a conversation that you have to pass with A or everything. There are no conversations like such or cinematics to skip. You can just walk away. We script it in a way that characters would be able to react to that and say like, oh, okay, no problem. So something happened to me here while I was replaying Metro. I was like, I thought I was hallucinating. So I finished this game several times, right? So I, I was like, oh, there's, I remember this plane. I know exactly where it was. And it was always part of my path when I'm playing this level. So it's like, I know there is like an upgrade here. And he's like, where is this upgrade? And I'm looking for this upgrade and I'm sure it's here. And I'm like, no, this is a body. Where is the upgrade? And I was sure it was in the cabin. And look at me trying to jump and trying to get it in the cabin. And I couldn't find it. You know? And I was like, where is this upgrade? Oh my God, I swear. So even though I worked for three years of my life in this game, I forgot some stuff. But guess what? I found the upgrade. It was just to the side. <laughs> what is a good upgrade? It's like a scope. It's a good upgrade. So I wanted this upgrade. I remember it perfectly. Another thing is that animals will sometimes like run away from you when they when you combat. So you'll see here like there's like they don't fight you. But this is a thing that I wanted to mention. The story sometimes happens with or without you. So you see your crew fighting a demon. This is scripted. But the idea is that to show that things happen around you when you are not there. And uh, again, this is a scene. This is what we consider as cinematic sometimes. But it, again, it's always optional. I think this is part of the philosophy of Half-Life. A lot of the people that work in Metro were like big fans of Far Cry. So a lot of them come from Stalker. And Stalker is, sim in, in, is similar to this. But also it's Half-Life who like, like the game that kind of made this happen, right? Like made the story happen around you and it's not just a cinematic. So, uh, and this is one of my favorite things about Metro is how, how the game explains things. It feels so real and so believable the way that things are like, hey, just point, right? So there's no UI, there's no, it's like, hey, look over there. You see that crane? Go there. I wish more games did this, to be honest, because I went from working in Metro to working in Far Cry 6, and I respect Far Cry 6 as well. For some time during Far Cry 6, we tried to do this type of development in which the UI was more minimalistic, that we guided the player through gameplay in a more holistic way, in a more diegetic way, but it was not successful. Ubisoft doesn't have the same philosophy as 4A games. But 4A games designs from the ground up for this type of things to work. That's why it's a crate there. That's why you see landmarks from far away. That's why the maps are specifically made in certain ways. So this is another cinematic. And again, they're all optional. This is the, the, the thing that I really enjoy about Metro. You're so in control. And funny thing is that when I started working on it, uh, when I got the opportunity to interview and do the test, I've never played Metro before. I was not in love with first person shooters in general i was like i want japanese rpgs you know but i learned so much i was like okay so let's do this i said like they i passed the first interview they sent me the first the the, the test and i'm like okay you know what let's get to it i went uh, i went hunker down in my room and i played metro 2033 and metro last light and i watch a video about the history of metro made by a youtuber called Ray Chepik. If you go and watch his newest Ubisoft uh, video, which I'll have link in the description, uh, you will see that I show up there. It's funny thing that it's because of his video that I was able to get a job in 4A Games and start my career. Then later I had the opportunity to meet him and form a friendship with him, talk for hours about the state of the video game industry and talk about future videos ideas and stuff like that. I was very inspired by him to start this YouTube channel as well. One of the best things about Metro is its use of silence. It knows when to pull back. When you're navigating in a boat, you hear the animals around you, but there's no music and there's actually very little sound. It's very meticulous. You hear the water a little bit. 
everything we sometimes even lower the volume a little bit systemically metro is a game that understands silence like none other its understanding of empty quiet moments is incredible is like it's my favorite in the whole industry to be honest and that is thanks to the director like Andri Prokhorov and that atmosphere that the game has the set dressing it's also him like the artists are great but it's all his philosophy it's all his philosophy of like immersion right which in my opinion is the best set dresser in the industry yeah i think uh, better than naughty dog in my opinion uh, i learned from him i learned his philosophy that's probably why but i think it's it's fantastic uh oh yeah there's like one of the few ever shock uh, scares jump scares that we have in the game and it's just to introduce these zombies that i hate the name uh, they're called humanimals <laughs> I don't like the name. This area used to be completely flat. And the idea was that you were on top of a crate uh, of the warehouse and you had to fight human animals to survive. But then I made a prototype in which it had like a layout that this is what you see. It was changed a little bit, but I was like talking to the lead game designer. It's like, it's just kind of kind of boring if it's all flat, you know? Let's do something with it. Let's like have a layout. I'm playing the game in easy. So the common encounter is not that interesting but but even then it, it was just it was just flat and it's like let's add explosive let's add a layout let's add a, a, the player to move around and stuff like that like that's what we did and it just improved significantly the the, the pacing and, and the feel of, of the fight i did the first pass but then the lead game designer his name is lin he did another pass and that's what you see in the game actually in this cinematic actually it looks like you're meant to stay with him but this is part of the di the diegetic nature of metro right so you're about to understand the whole map and this is the last thing we'll see today and then we'll continue i think this is going to be a three-part series about metro exus maybe not one after the other but let's see <laughs> so this cinematic is one of the examples prime examples of the diegetic nature of metro the characters see almost the same amount of information that the player sees you know there is very minimalistic ui and if there is UI, is to represent the knowledge the character would have. So there is no secret knowledge. There is no secret health bars or secret waypoints that the player should know, but the character doesn't. The UI represents the knowledge the characters have to do certain things, you know, that they carry, right? If, and if the UI does not represent that, then it does not exist. He will give us the binoculars just now. He will talk to us and guide us through the map so you can see what is there. So that is your final objective. That's the bridge. Then he tells you, to the right, you will find a, like a hangar. It's called the terminal. This is what's there. And then if you keep looking right, and this is where I think here was a little bit complicated because more to the right, there is a metal beak that stops you from seeing. So you get confused a little bit, but the reality is that what he's describing is gonna be something here, there. You see, so you have to move a little bit. So because it's sometimes really difficult to explain with words and to guide the player and expect to react, sometimes little things fall through cracks. But I think that that's a risk worth taking for a game of this nature. Now, all this cinematic, you don't have to see it. You can just go to the ladder and move along. <laughs> and, and the characters will react. It's like, oh, you don't want to listen to this? Okay. And then Crest, this character, will give you the binoculars here instead. So let's leave it here for now. We're going to do uh, more Metro Exodus. Uh, this is a three-parter. Please look forward to it. Please let me know if this is interesting. There's a lot more information to share about Metro Exodus. And there are certain things I want to show you guys as well. Many stories to tell. I'm going to leave you guys with a teaser. This level was almost the reason why Metro Exodus got cancelled, but at the same time was its saving grace. That's all I'm gonna say about Metro Exodus. I hope you guys enjoyed it. This is Santi. This is the Game Design Perspective. Like, comment, subscribe. Let me know what you guys think. Is this format too long? Is it too much information? Is it too little information? There's a lot more things to talk about the development of Metro Exodus as we go through this level. Anyway, have a good one. Peace. <laughs>